Okay, very good. Uh, welcome to the first presentation of our NAB 2022 series. My name is Wes Simpson and I'll be uh, hosting this event. Really happy to have Kieran Cunha here from Open Broadcast Systems. He has been doing a uh, heck of a job keeping uh, some broadcasters online uh, throughout a lot of challenging circumstances and really looking forward to his presentation on how to explain ST2110 to a six-year-old. Here you go, Kieran. Thanks, Web. So I thought I'd do a quick, quick introduction to the company. Uh, what we do is we build software encoders and decoders for transporting live video around the world for sports, news, and channels. Uh, this is entirely a B2B thing. Um, we're based in central London, so for the last two years, I've been pointing over there and saying, I can see Big Ben, so you're gonna have to go look over there and pretend you can see Big Ben. Um, so, yeah, we build everything in-house, as I kind of mentioned, hardware, firmware, software, you name it, uh, the entire 2110 stack. Um, the other thing is we're not to be confused with the quote-unquote the other OBS, uh, which is the uh, web streaming software. So, what is ST2110? Um, famously, this quote is falsely attributed to Einstein or Richard Feynman, but if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, you don't really understand it yourself. And as I kind of mentioned in my uh, little time filler, I've not really seen any webinars or papers really explain what's going on. Um, either they're way too detailed or they hand wave away complexities. Uh, I really enjoy the way some presenters just hand away literally years of my life going, ah, oh, it's easy, you just do this. I'm like, yeah, this was years of work, you've just pretended didn't exist. Um, very, very jargon heavy. Uh, this is really not good for um, trying to get people on to understand new topics immediately throwing people into jargon is not the way to do that. And there's not an explanation of why things are done. There's just an explanation of these things are done, but there's no real explanation of why. So um, I'm going to try and have my cake and eat it here and simplify five years of my life into 15 minutes. So let's go for it. So, so where are we today in the making of live television, a production, the making of content? So not the... the not the way that television signals get to the home. And these use these old-fashioned things on the, on the, well, on my left and your right. Uh, these are known as serial digital interface cables. They're very old-fashioned, they're coaxial. There's no real other use of them in the consumer world. And it's a very old-fashioned electrical signal, and it transmits what was a very large amount of data in the past, uh, many gigabits. Uh, nowadays, my phone can process a gigabit. I can do a speed test with 5G, and I can get several gigabits now without a major issue. So nowadays, it's not so much. And it takes one television signal with pictures and sound in a single cable and other historical signals that I'm not really going to talk about, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say they cause problems. And it requires custom broadcast-specific equipment to switch between these signals, to cut between cameras, for example, and I'll show you some more uh, examples of that. And really, it's completely specific to the television industry. It's a huge mess of cables. There's lots and lots of channels. There's a lot more content out there, and each of those Services requires yet more of these old-fashioned cables. And we don't want to use those. And there's this little thing called the internet you may have heard of, and it's growing really, really quickly. Uh, YouTube, social media, big data. And so we can use the technology behind the internet, so not necessarily the internet itself, to send these pictures and sounds in a facility. So we're not sending them long haul. Uh, that, that's what we do as a company. We, send, we, we pick things up from a facility and transport them long haul, but but we do need to pick them up and drop them off. And as you can see, uh, speeds are growing. They're doubling every five years. This is, it's really remarkable um, that we're going we're gonna to reach terabits very shortly at relatively modest costs. And so what we do is we take a live television signal with pictures and sounds, and we chop them up into thousands of little pieces known as packets. And we send them over, in this case, a wired network. Um, that's because a wired network is much more stable than, say, a wireless network. It could, in theory, be done. It's probably not a good idea. And we can also transport hundreds of these television signals in a single cable in both directions. And this means the and the other thing is the equipment is from a much bigger industry: big data, YouTube, Netflix. Uh, in fact, a Netflix engineer just came to my booth um, who works on this. It's much, much bigger than television. Pro probably a single Facebook data center is bigger than probably all the television data centers put in the world. These are stadium-sized facilities. And so they have massive economy. They have massive economies of scale. Things are much cheaper. So I'm going to have to talk quite a bit about time um, here. So imagine I took two clocks, say a microwave and an oven, and I set them to the same time, and I leave it for a few days or a week. 
These times won't be the same afterwards. Um, each clock has its own little time source that ticks, and they have minute differences, but these small differences add up over time. And that can depend on heat, uh, the location, such as the altitude, so in Denver, for example, could be a little bit different, the manufacture of the clock. That's not a problem in our lives most, most of the time, because things like our phones, they connect to the internet and set, their, set its time. But as I'll try to explain, this isn't good enough for what we need. So each television picture that you see, in a simple case, is generated from a clock on the camera or the microphone, etc. And in Europe, just for simplicity, I'll try and avoid explaining to a six-year-old fractional frame rates. I don't want to scar them for life. Um, what? It's 25 of these pictures a second. And if the clocks don't match, it's very hard to actually cut between these camera angles. So I want to cut to this different angle, but I haven't actually got a frame there anymore. They're not aligned between these two camera angles. So it's actually not very easy to cut because when I want to cut, I actually haven't got, they're not aligned correctly. So what we do is we take another old, even older old fashioned signal and we keep them together, known as a gen lock. So yet another cable that causes even more complexity. So now these are aligned, we can cut between them easily. And it's worth saying on the web, zoom, webcast, they don't do this. They just wait an extra frame and then they do their cut. So this is something relatively specific to the broadcast industry. So we have this thing called uh, leap years, as you all know. Um, the Earth goes around the sun. If anyone disagrees with that, maybe this is not the right place for you. But who knows after the last two years? Many, many different uh, beliefs out there. So if there are any uh, flat earthers or uh, non-Copernican non uh, heliocentric uh, believers, please, please, uh, <laughs> this is maybe not the presentation for you. But um, anyway, going back to the simple answer, as we all know, we insert a leap year to compensate for the fact the Earth doesn't perfectly go around the sun in 365 days. It's actually 365.2422 days. And we really kind of have to, we have to manage that because otherwise the seasons won't align. There's, there's loads of issues. And, and although we, we, we have leap years, there are also these things for much smaller adjustments called leap seconds. And um, we hit them at certain times when the clock strikes New Year's in England, when Big Ben strikes New Year's, sometimes we insert these leap seconds. And the issue is, if, if we use, if we insert these leap seconds, when I'm watching Big Ben Strike Midnight, all of, all of the televisions in, in England or anyone in, in Greenwich Mean Time will glitch for a second as the leap second is inserted. And that's one of the reasons we can't just use the same mechanism, the same means that your phone gets to get a television signal. And so what we do is we use GPS, uh, satellite navigation. The, the, the way that works involves having a very high quality time source, although it gets you from A to B, it has a very high quality time source and hasn't, it doesn't have these leap seconds, so time doesn't jump. And what we do is we take, these, we take these signals and we transport them as packets over the network. So we don't use a special cable anymore to do that in what's known as precision time protocol. And this is a much better quality than an internet connected clock. So as I mentioned, we take all these pictures and we split them up into thousands of little packets. But we all have to agree, everyone in a facility has to agree on a start position, because otherwise they'll be misaligned. And so what we've all decided as an industry is to take the 1st of January 1970, that's known as the PTP epoch, and we imagine there is an imaginary signal that started then. There wasn't digital video back then, but imagine there was, and time started ticking. So a clock ticked for every single frame, and 42 years later, we're now. And so we work out how many, how many pictures we should have sent, and we send on the next tick. And that means every single sender in a facility is now aligned. All the packets are aligned with each other now. So we take, we take all these pa packets, lots of pictures and sounds, split them into packets, and we send them over the network. They're given an address, a destination, and the way the network works means you can send to multiple people. So I can send my packets to all of you if I want to, or I could just send my packets to Adi over there, and the rest of you can't see that. But it has the advantage, if Adi doesn't want to process any video, he just wants to look at the sounds, he doesn't have to join these, this very large amount of video data anymore. Likewise, there's some people who don't care about the sound, they just want to put a graphic on the video or something. But the problem that you've got is, um, when I receive these packets as a receiver, when Adi receives these packets, he has to know when they came from. So. You just get a bunch of video packets and a bunch of sounds, and you need to make sure that when this guy kicks the ball, you actually hear the ball kicking, and it's not too early or it's not too late. Um, 
so that things can get in sync. And what you do with each packet is attach the time, a timestamp, so we can put this puzzle back together. So me as a receiver, I receive a bunch of packets, and I need to figure out, does this piece of sound correspond with when he's kicking the ball, or does it correspond to before he's kicked the ball? Does it correspond when someone is cheering in the goal? And we use the timestamp to put this back together. I would, as an aside, point out, in reality, this is a bit that goes really badly wrong. In, in every facility, I've seen the timestamp be s often substantially wrong by weeks, months. Um, this is the bit we need to work on, these timestamps. So key points I've talked about. Um, we want to use this modern IP technology to make live television. And the biggest challenge probably is, is agreeing that everyone is working to the same time source. We agreed television started on the 1st of January 1970, and it ticked along until now. And then I find the next point where I need to start sending, and I, I send on that point. And we split these pictures up into thousands of packets. We, s we make sure we send them at the right time ha and have the correct timestamp. So anyone wants to receive it can take these packets and figure out how to synchronize them again. And to be honest, the rest, it's just jargon and implementation details. There's nothing really more to it than that. That said, these implementation details are um, decades, half a year, of uh, half a decade of work. So I've deliberately run short so that we can do Q&A. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, please let me know. Will something replace timestamp one of these days? <laughs> no one's using them anyway, so people are just playing them out as they come on the wire. So. No, no audio device is using it. And we set our timestamp to zero. All the audio devices work perfectly. We can replace it, but let's use it first. <laughs> and in real facilities, I see time going backwards and forwards all the time. Uh, it's just nobody notices. Karen, thank you very much. That was really um, to the point and very uh, educational. Again, we had Kieran Cunha from Open Broadcast Systems.